Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today's um, Lunch and Learn session. This is part of TSL's Tankstream Labs um, Lunch and Learn series. So for those who don't know who Tankstream Labs are, we are a co-working space for tech startups with a global focus. Um, we have three offices across Australia, two in Sydney and one in Perth. And the way that we started was back in 2012, Tim Fung, who is the CEO and co-founder of Airtasker, wanted a place for him and his his entrepreneurial friends um, to work out of and to collaborate. So that's how Tankstream Labs was started in 2012. So um, TSL Lunch and Learn series, this is part of our digital um, program. We generally um, normally have these exclusive to TSL members only, but during this period, we've decided to open up some sessions to the general public as well, including today's session. Um, but if you do want to find out more about our digital offering and more content um, like today, please vi visit our website at tankstreamlabs.com. Um, but for now, I'd love to introduce um, your host, host, guide, leader, uh, whatever you want to call him uh, for today, Adam Faulkner, who is the Experience Design Director. Did I get that right? You did. Awesome. Um, from Nailed Little Wake. <laughs> and Adam is one of our longest running members from our Bridge Street office. So I will hand it over to um, Adam today to, uh, for the Lunch and Learn series on facilitating remote research. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Nita. Um, goodness, I forgot that Tim started it in 2012. Yeah, I would have been there very yeah. soon after it started. I think I was probably, I, we started on level one, which is where which is where the BuzzFeed guys are now. But yeah, it was uh, level one. We were all together. Tim was on the desk behind me. The Expert 360 guys, the girls were on the desk in front of me. It was, uh, um, there was even Go, Go Catch. It was a pretty crazy time. So there was lots of, lots of cool businesses and startups there at the time. So it was a, it was a good time to be part of it. Um, yeah, today, so we, so I'm a, we, I started Blue Egg about, 2013, 2012, so about eight years ago. And um, we focus on a lot of qualitative research. We do a lot of, um, you know, a lot of time with, spent with users, understanding what they do, behaviours, needs, analysis, that kind of stuff. And then we try and um, translate that into meaningful evidence-based insights to help improve designs. So one of the things, obviously, in this current environment that we needed to make sure that we continue to do really well was qualitative research because... Um, often qualitative research is seen as only being effective when it is face-to-face. -face. So what I wanted to take you through today was a whole lot of different uh, tools and, and things that we use to help us um, improve the success of doing our face-to-face our -face qualitative research. Um, as I go through the presentation, um, if you do have any questions or there's things that you want to do, please mention them. I won't be able to see you putting your hand up, so I know Anita is going to be fielding that if you want to ask questions as we go please do um, yep. if you want to ask me questions about the pro products we're using then please do um, or otherwise we can talk all about it at the end as well so yeah definitely jump in pretty easy if there's noises here it's probably because it's uh, you know lunchtime so kids who are being work from school from home are uh, <laughs> having lunch there's birds in the backyard there's dogs barking so there's plenty of things to be distracted by but uh, hopefully we'll get through it all right and so, just to let everyone know, there is a chat box, um, a chat function as well. So if you have any questions or anything, please pop it in there because that's probably where I'm going to see it the most because I still need to scroll and make sure I see everyone. So if you do have any questions, the best way to do it is to put it into the chat and I'll make sure Adam um, gets the questions. Thanks, Nita. All Thanks, right. Adam. I'm going to jump onto the Prezo. All right. So hopefully you can all see that, which is talking about remote research techniques. Um, yep, we're good. Thanks, Nina. All right, so the first thing I always ask is how do you feel? Now, it's important in the current environment that we are still very empathic when it comes to our relationships with other people. You know, I think very early on, this sort of socially distancing policy kind of in its own language made it feel like people had to be socially distanced from people. Um, I think it was more about being physically distanced um, and socially connected. Um, so I think we need to make sure that we ask how people feel, make sure that we're very cognizant about how people are going in terms of their current environment, how their anxiety is. We need to be really aware. Um, this is often a question that I ask and people think it's a trick question. Um, often people find it very hard to answer. <laughs> so the how do you feel question, whilst it seems a bit flippant, often people find it quite difficult to answer. So if you find it something that you don't understand why people can't answer that it's probably because 
you just think a little bit differently to them. So I think at the moment it's a good time to, you know, be empathic, to be calm and to just ask people how they feel. And if they can't say straight away then just be mindful of that and tell them how you feel, you know, that's a good way to start. The reason why I say that is because it does all, particularly with remote research, it does all start with empathy. And often if you're doing in-person research, it's all about having that connection with the person. You know, and often a, a, a research session will take 30 minutes to an hour to, to facilitate. And so you've got a very short period of time to develop a connection with the participant that you're actually interviewing to be able to get more meaningful insights out of them. So adding the barrier of a screen where you don't actually have the time with them in person can actually, you know, present a lot of challenges. So how do we overcome those challenges? Because as I said, we're now, you know, 1.5 meters apart or two arms lengths if you're in the, in New Zealand. Um, all right. So remote research, we've been asked this a lot, a lot, a lot. A lot of our clients, um, a lot of designers have all been coming to us asking for tools. They've been asking us for ways that we approach it, asking us for, you know, how, how is it different? I think the reality is, is that in uh, design and user experience and qualitative research, all of the tools have been uh, online, collaborative, and no need to be in the office for a very long time. So when all of this happened, um, for us in particular, it wasn't too difficult to move to a completely working from home environment because all of our tools enabled us to be collaborative, enabled us to um, facilitate effective sessions. Um, and really the biggest challenge wasn't whether we were capable, was convincing others that it was going to be as effective. Um, and I think that's something that we're continuing to do in terms of educating. Um, and continuing to do in terms of, uh, you know, delivering uh, research-based projects um, with clients at the moment. But as I said, the keys are being empathic, being kind, and being mindful. But when it comes to what do we do different? Well, we, we actually still follow the same process, but with a few tweaks along the way. So, you know, we have a process where we, we actually follow quite a, quite a clear approach to how we do things. And so that approach is pretty clear in terms of, you know, engaging with the client at the beginning. Now that engagement is happening over um, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, uh, depending on what tools they want to use to connect. Um, they seem to be the two most common that we're coming across. Um, some smaller clients are still using some other uh, tools like Skype still is around there a little bit, but we're finding that Zoom and Microsoft Teams are, are kicking in. Google Hangouts has also been there a little bit as well, but we find the call quality is not amazing on that. So I guess that's the, that's the trick. Um, Anita, I can see some flashing now of a couple of questions. So if there is a chat there, let me know if we need to stop. Um, okay. Now when it comes, okay, cool. Um, now when it comes to that engagement piece, stakeholders and engagement with stakeholders is a really key thing right up front. So we always facilitate interviews with them as well. So I'll talk to you about specific tools that we're using to do the interviews. When it comes to facilitating workshops, though, I think that's been the biggest challenge. So we talk about remote research with a larger group of people. Um, that is a challenge. There is a bit of software that I think people have probably started playing with called Miro, M-I-R-O, and I'll show you some screenshots of that a little bit later. And that's pretty good because it allows you to bring a lot of different artifacts together. But we've also started using um, Adobe XD's new plugins as well that allow you to do that too collaboratively. So there's a whole lot of new ways that you can do this. I think the workshops that we've run, the really big key is that you have to be super prepared. And unlike this sort of sense of winging it when you do a workshop uh, and you're there with the people, because you can, you can sense the, you can sense the uh, emotion from the participants. Um, I think you have to be super prepared for a online workshop. So what we've been doing is we've been providing key artifacts to the participants beforehand. We've been um, really engaging with them to make sure that they were clear of the expectations of the workshops. And then we've also been giving them documentation on the tools that we're using during the workshop to make sure they're not learning how to use those tools during the workshop. Because there's this sort of time stuck where you, uh, you know, you send somebody a link to do something and then they, they, 
they only wait until the meeting or the workshop is on to use that and they don't actually know how to do it, which means that you end up having to waste everybody's time while they click on something, download something, do something, you know, it's, it's a shambles. So you've really got to make sure that you set it up for success by giving them all of the documentation and all of the stuff prior to those workshops and prior to those interviews. And I think that's, that's a, probably a big, a big shift in terms of enabling the participants prior to the sessions. Make sure you give them as much information beforehand because otherwise you're just going to, it's setting yourself up for trouble and you don't need to do that because I think, you know, you can do a quick PDF screenshots, circles, click this button. What do I need to do? It's really quick to give them a document piece of documentation that they can refer to, which avoids wasting other people's time on a call. Um, you know, then that research facilitation. Well, I'm going to take you through how we talk about a, a research plan, which we still do. Um, the synthesis as well. We do synthesis in a way that we've been doing it for a while, which doesn't rely on post-it notes. You know, the traditional form was post-it notes, but you can still do that now very effectively um, remotely. Um, and then the same with prototyping. Now, there's a lot of different prototyping tools when it comes to that spitting out of how you actually turn something from an insight driven um, bit of information to uh, evidence-based designs. So the tool that we use heavily is Adobe XD, uh, but there is Figma, there is Sketch. They're probably the other two that I'd say that are probably the most popular at the moment. Um, and then there's a huge raft of others. Uh, we use Adobe XD because it fits nicely in the suite, you know, with um, Photoshop and InDesign and some other things in terms of asset sharing. But, um, but yeah, it's up to you in terms of what approach you want to take there. Then our usability testing, again, it's sort of a similar approach to the research facilitation and then findings in terms of how we deliver those to, to stakeholders. But what are your objectives? It's always key, regardless of remote or not. You may, need to make sure you're very clear on your objectives of why you're doing something. Often a client will say, we need to talk to users and then we'll say why and they'll not know. Um, and it's really important that we have an objective at the beginning because I'm a scientist by background. Uh, so I did pharmacology at Sydney Uni. Um, and I think it's important that in everything that we do in terms of research is to apply a very rigorous scientific approach to it. So what's our objective to talking to these customers, these users? Why are we talking to them? What's our hy hypothesis? What do we actually hope to achieve by talking to them? What are the outcomes? that really helps focus in on what you're doing. Because if you have that focus at the beginning, the management of expectations and the outcomes, it's a very rewarding process. So I think that's a really important thing to do. So as I said, right at the beginning, it's that, you know, that review and engagement. So we can still review analytics. So we still, before we do research, we review analytics. So Google Analytics is a classic example. You know, you can go in there and you can review behavior. You can see linear behaviors, linear flows. And that gives you a really good starting ground in terms of the user's expectations, the type of content they want, what is it they're actually wanting to do when they get to your thing that they use, whether it's a website or whether it's a mobile app or um, maybe it's a enterprise software. Um, so it depends on what it is you're reviewing in terms of analytics, but it's a good place to start. Um, you know, you can do that analysis of archetypes or personas. Um, you can then develop what I call that research plan as well, which is, to me, it's a scientific principles. You know, we want to have a very clear research plan before we actually start to talk to users. You know, and it's always critical that you know who your users are. So we really need to know who the users are, but it all starts with a research plan in my, in my mind. And this is one that we did not that long ago. Um, and the, the importance of a research plan is that it allows you to outline some key things. And these key things can be shared with internal stakeholders, as well as a guide for the facilitator of those remote interviews. So when it comes to the internal stakeholders, we can share this and circulate it a few times, ensure that everybody's across the types of questions that we're asking, make sure it meets the objectives of what they want to learn. You know, often they'll read the questions and say, oh, okay, but what about, what about this extra thing? And we can say, well, we don't need to have that as a question because we can probe that as an outcome because what we want to do is avoid bias. So it's a delicate balance between asking those questions that we need and also 
letting the user um, tell their story so that we don't lead their, their answers, which is really important. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the client or the, the person you're doing these research um, interviews for can sometimes be quite biased because they might have built the thing or they might be very close to it or it's their project. And so they're obviously going to say, you know, so tell me more why you like the thing that I'm doing. Uh, so you've really got to try and negate that. We always talk about those objectives, as I said, the environment that we're doing it in, the types of participants that we're doing, uh, that we're interviewing, as well as the questions. So they start broad. You always start with broad questions because you want to learn from them. And then as you go through the interview, you then narrow those questions to be more specific relating to the objective and the thing that you're interested in at the moment. And then we also add tasks as well. So you put tasks in there. I think tasks are important because if there's a current state experience, particularly enterprise software is a good example of that. If there's a current state experience where users go through and do a thing and we know that it's terrible, um, the insights we gain from them going through that task are really important because it, it helps inform and guide if we need to do new designs or provide recommendations or really guide those outcomes that we want to get. Um, the shift from our normal research plan, I think at the moment is you need to always, as I said before, ask those participants how they feel at the beginning, really, really talk to them in terms of the current environment, environment, address it. We're all in the same boat. I'm in the backyard, you know, everybody's at home, address it because that way we can move forward. Um, and be clear on how those online incentives work. So if you, you are providing incentives, Normally we would hand somebody a, a gift card. If we're doing it online, make sure that the participant either gets it within the first minute of the interview starting, or they're very clear during that first couple of minutes when they will get it. Because you don't want them to be spending the whole interview thinking about whether I'm actually gonna get my $50 or not. You need to tell them right up front. And that's a very clear thing to do. Um, but just make sure they understand how the online incentive works because it can be a bit different depending on which, which tool you're using. And so that's research facilitation. So when it comes to recruitment, there's a whole bunch of ways you can do that. Um, we, we, from a simple level, we use Airtasker. So Tim's got that set up pretty well. So you can use Airtasker when it comes to um, getting participants who don't have such specific um, facets attached to them. So you know, you could, well, probably not many research uh, programs happening for travel at the moment, but if you, when that comes back online, if you're interviewing people in travel, um, you would find that, you know, you could potentially go by age groups and a, and a hypothesis that it's more about life stage when it comes to them traveling. Um, and so Airtask would, would be quite a good, quick way to find participants. Um, we use things like Askable though, when it comes to more specifics, you know, often in finance, there's people who have specifics attached to them in particular needs, um, high net worth individuals, in which case people like Askable are a, quite a quick, um, easy tool to use, but they are more expensive. So I guess it depends on your budget and it depends on what client work you're doing and how many interviews you're facilitating. As I said, the facilitation we're using uh, Zoom, Lookback and Otter and sometimes Microsoft Teams. I'll talk to you a little bit more about Lookback and Otter and why we do that. Uh, we record all of our sessions, which I think is important. We provide live links for all of our sessions so that when people and, facil and um, stakeholders are, are watching those interviews, if they watch them live, it's fantastic because what happens is they will punch a question out to our note taker and the note taker will say, oh, okay, great. Um, we need to ask another question and we can ask those extra questions live. Um, so the stakeholders get really involved. It's a really, really neat way to do it. And again, all of these tools work really effectively. It doesn't matter where you are. So that stakeholder can be at home, you know, and, and I can be at home and the participants at home. And it's as effective as if they were coming into our lab in the city. But the thing that I think is important here is the primer. So you need to give them that primer. And this is, as I was saying before, with those stakeholders as well, before a workshop, you need to do a one page primer on how to use the tool you're using. I've been in, I'm sure we've all been in about 300 Zooms in the last month. I mean, it's a tool that I hardly ever used. Now I use, you know, all the time. Um, and there's still a number of people who don't know how to share stuff and they don't know where to put them. They don't realize they're on camera. I'm like, you know, please put a shirt on, all that kind of stuff. But give them a primer, which says, 
these are the things we need you to do, right? We need you to have Zoom installed. We need you to make sure you share your screen with us. We need to make sure you've got your microphone on because I mean, half the time people don't, you know, they're talking and it's like, okay, now you turn your microphone off and on. Okay. But, um, you know, show them all the different things that they need to know because that's just so really important and it sets it up for success. And again, you've only got 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe an hour with them. It's a limited time and you do not want to waste five or 10 minutes of that interview time setting up Zoom. It's just not what you want to do. Do a one pager, super easy. Do a screenshot if you want to make it really clear, send it to the participant beforehand. That helps a lot. It's helped us significantly. Now, when it comes to scheduling everybody in, we use a tool called Calendly. So you may or may not be familiar with Calendly. Calendly takes a lot of pain out of this process. The last thing you want to do if you're doing remote interviews with people and say you've got to do 10 or 20 is to be sending calendar invites back and forward. You know, oh, sorry, Adam, I can't actually do uh, today at four, but I can do 4.15. And you're like, oh, okay, I'll go back to you. Oh, here's a new link for 4.15. Oh, no, I can do four now. Don't want to be doing all of that admin stuff. Set up all your different times that you're available in Calendly. Send someone a link. They can go in and they can change their time availabilities all in there. So it kind of puts that back on them. This can sync with Outlook or with your Gmail or whatever you're using. So it's, it's a really neat tool. This is really helpful. Trust me. Um, definitely recommend it. All right. Now, from there, we have a tool called Lookback. Now, you may or may not be familiar with Lookback. There's a couple of different tools out there. We use Lookback because it allows us to um, effectively record the face of the person who we're interviewing or the participant, the screen that we're sharing that we want to see their interactions of, and their audio. This is the tool that allows us to give a live link to the stakeholders. It also allows us to have them stored in the cloud in an encrypted secure way so that post these interviews, they can be watched. Because not all, not all um, stakeholders can come and watch them live. And I think that's important too, because you don't want them to feel that they have to be watching them live. They can watch them post. And if they don't have time to watch 20 hours of 20, video, of 20 interviews, then at the end of this, this also lets us set up and do quite easy highlights of all the different ones as well. So you can do a little snippet of all the different um, interviews that you do so that you can drop that out, put it into a PowerPoint and, um, and watch that. So we'll just watch this really quickly and you'll get a little bit of a feel for how it goes. What are your thoughts on the left information on the left panel? Okay, it's in flow. And what do you believe total storage refers to? Total storage would be storage in Copen, I'd imagine. Okay, yep. Yeah. In flow into Copen, water available. Bit of a worry when water available is higher than total storage. <laughs> so not accurate data. <laughs> and so that sort of, those kind of videos, they're really powerful. They're really powerful because they allow us to, um, if the stakeholders haven't been involved, they allow us to convey empathy, uh, often anxiety, confusion, um, and really convey the sometimes very real struggles that the users have to do or to interact or to, um, use the thing that the, the, the client or the stakeholder wants them to use. So it's very powerful. So I really recommend video artifacts as a key. I know I've seen a few um, people at the moment who are doing research without the video. Honestly, without the video, it makes it very hard. I think you really do have to have video working as a real key. And if that's not working, it, it makes it very challenging to be able to interpret the responses of the users and I think video is a real key and so some of those tools as I've mentioned uh, are tools like uh, Microsoft Teams up the left uh, now Microsoft Teams you know you have to play with it a little bit you do have to have a Microsoft account it's not as easy to set up as Zoom um, the reason we use it though is because we've worked with a, a number of government clients uh, and also a lot of uh, tier one corporate clients who've got quite rigorous security and the Microsoft Teams is really more embedded into their security environment. So you might find that you'll need to use that as well. 
we've not found an issue with using it in terms of quality. It really does work very similarly to the Zoom, so there's no real drama with it. Um, the one thing that you're seeing there is a tool called Otter. So in the background, when we're doing all of our um, interviews, we always have a AI tool in the background that's recording the audio as well. So the audio is being recorded as part of the video in Lookback, but we do also do a secondary kind of backup of that audio recording. And that does a couple of things. It provides us a backup of the audio, um, but it also provides us with a AI that um, grabs all of the interview and then uh, transcribes it for us. So what we can do then is we can take that transcription and put it into a tool called Dovetail. So Dovetail, I'll show you in a second, um, is our way to synthesize. And so I think, you know, that's the, that's a, another one of those areas that people have said, well, how do we, how do you do synthesis of, you know, large scale uh, remote um, user interviews when you're not in the same room? Because the classic kind of theory on that, I'll show you in a second, is that we're all kind of uh, doing post-it notes together, right? And so I'll just touch on this one quickly where we talk about the affinity mapping of insights. And, and that's what we're talking about. How do we do that effectively when we're not together? Um, because how do we identify key concepts and insights and features? And then how do we start to get some of those outputs going? Um, and so this kind of classic approach, you know, where you had um, designers in a room and they were going through the research and they were sort of identifying all the insights and the clusters of areas that they needed to focus on. You know, this is a very, uh, this is very effective, right? But if you're not able to work together, particularly that closely, in a room, what do you do? What are the alternatives? Because um, it can be quite challenging. And I think that's been one of the exciting things for us is there is a, there is a tool um, because we're not lone wolves. We don't work together. We can't synthesize 20 interviews by ourselves. That's really hard. Um, so we use a tool called Dovetail. So Dovetail is a really neat startup. It came out of Atlassian, a couple of guys out of Atlassian. Um, who set it up um, and they really noticed a gap in the market when it came to the synthesizing data of qualitative research or research in general. Um, so let me just show you a bit of a video here. So what you've got here is you've got a whole lot of information in terms of interviews that have come into the, into the system. This is sort of raw data where we've got a lot of information in here. You've then got a lot of tags that we've done. So we've tagged up a lot of data against the interview. So it allows us to tag up all these different, um, all these different insights. And then as you go into the tags, you scroll through and you can see where it appeared in each of those individual interviews. So you've got all your different interviews in here. And then now all of a sudden you've got all the tags against it. You've got this ability to then pull in all the, the highlights. And so the highlights um, sort of sit like a, Excel spreadsheet almost, which is neat because you've got the insights there, all the tags that we've got, we've got all of the key little um, uh, quotes that we needed. And then we've now all of a sudden got a chart with all the insights as well. And I think that this chart is what it does for a long time. When you work with stakeholders who don't quite understand qualitative research, they really need quant. They need hard data. And this is giving us hard data. And I think that's the, that's the trick is how do we get some hard data out of, out of the system um, to be able to, well, it looks like that video is going a bit of fun. <laughs> um, how do we get some hard data out of the system to be able to, um, to be able to then give quantitative numbers to stakeholders? You know, how many, how many of these things, how many, how many times did onboarding come up? How many times was there an issue with team culture? Were there a lot of golden nuggets that we needed to identify? You know, those types of things are really powerful. And I think that getting qualitative data into ingested into Dovetail that we can, as designers, work on in remote locations and tag up. I can see tags that someone else has done. Other designers can see work I've done. We're working together. You start to see the clusters. You start to see these insights. It's a very effective tool. Um, and it's, yeah, it's fantastic that this came around. It's been going for a couple of years now. Uh, we've been using it sort of since the beginning of last year. And I'm glad we had because it meant that it was very easy transition for us a couple of months ago to be able to continue to synthesize data like this. Okay, so I'll move across. There's another tool as well. So when it comes to uh, working on client work, when you're doing this remote research, often you have to have 
a bit of an audit or a bit of a review of content or structure or site or um, uh, you know information to be able to inform the synthesis process as well. So we use another tool called Airtable. So you might be familiar with Airtable. And Airtable is another collaborative tool. So think of a Excel spreadsheet um, uh, and then just magnify it on steroids. It's really powerful. It's a lot more, lot more powerful than the, um, than the Google one as well. It's just a really powerful tool. We found that it allows us to, it's like having an open kind of SQL database that we can drop all sorts of information into images, uh, which is fantastic. All kinds of um, tags in here in terms of who people are assigned to do what, content types, uh, whether they've uh, done things. Uh, it, it allows us to have our users in here or our stakeholders that are in here. Um, so the stakeholders can see what's going on. They can add content as we wish. We can restrict the kind of content that they add. So this is a really neat supporting tool when it comes to facilitating this uh, remote research in terms of us having a, a centralized way to track certain types of content and information, uh, information architecture as well, um, that I think is really important. Um, and then as part of the Airtable, there's one more that we would use, which is another one called MindMeister. And MindMeister is where we uh, have a, a mind mapping tool uh, that also allows us to put in more structured collaborative information architecture. So once we've done that sort of interview piece, we often have to come out with recommendations on a revised information architecture as a clear outcome of the interviews. You know, what is the content types they want, which we've now got in Airtable. So what kind of content do they want? What kind of information are they after? What's the hierarchy of importance that they want to look at things? So the MindMeister allows us to start to put a new IA in place and that new IA can allow us to have a really clear, um, really clear process. It's extremely collaborative again, um, and it does allow for you to have clients in there. It does allow for you to have stakeholders in there. The one thing I would say though, is if you give clients or stakeholders access, don't give them the ability to add or change content. <laughs> unless you really want them to. Um, so if they are sort of the key person that you're dealing with, then yes, but don't let that happen for a, a broader group because you really want to make it tight and you really want to make sure this is a, a central point of truth. Um, but this has definitely been another great tool. I think the thing can feel that you've got a lot of different tools when it comes to it, but really each of these are used or not used based off the objectives I was talking about right at the beginning. What are the objectives of the research? Why are we doing this? Because I may not need to use MindMeister, or maybe I do. I may not use, need to use Airtable, or maybe I do. Um, so you don't use all of these all of the time. You use all of these some of the time. And I think that's key, because otherwise it could feel overwhelming if you've got 10 or 15 different tools being used for each project. It could become a little bit unwieldy, and it's not necessary. And then when it comes to those findings, how do we actually deal with those findings? How do we, um, how do, we do you know, the findings workshop? So I talked a little bit about Miro before, um, and we also talk about what are those design artifacts as well? How does that look? And I talked a bit about Adobe XD. Um, Adobe XD is a tool that we've been using for quite some time, um, and it's a, it's a prototyping tool, right? So at its base level, it's a prototyping tool like Figma or Sketch. Um, but what it does have is a couple of really neat features. One is that firstly, you can prototype straight out of this, which means that you don't need to use Envision. Um, I've just found Envision to be a bit buggy, but I know that uh, a lot of people use it. And if you use Envision, that's still a pretty good tool as well. I just prefer to bring things into one, to one product. Um, so what I'll show you here is a bit of a video. And, you know, if on one aspect, we've got some, you know, standard stuff that you would expect to see from a prototyping in terms of how you use you know, content and copy, how you use colors, what kind of cards and layouts we've got in here, what are the pixels and sizes and heights and all of that stuff. Um, I think the interesting thing with Adobe XD is that they're also moving towards this more collaborative approach. So you see here, we've got a whole bunch of templates in here now using that whiteboard plugin, which do allow us to bring in all these different things here where we can invite uh, stakeholders and we can do collaborative workshops, you know, uh, with these sorts of templates as a guide because they can 
grab all the post-it notes from the left, which I'll this video will show you in a second. And you know, how might we statements? All this kind of customer journey mapping. There's a lot of classic things we do that they're bringing and giving us templates for, which I think is really, really fantastic and saves a lot of time. You can see there's a lot of templates they've got going on here on the left. Um, you know, empathy mapping, um, we've got heat, we have heat mapping, we've got personas, and use cases, SWATs. It's really rich in terms of templates here. This is a free plugin uh, you can get. Uh, again, I don't get any benefit from saying this about Adobe XD. I just found that this is a really useful tool. Um, uh, and look again, you can see this is how your stakeholders will interact. So they can bring across um, different, different approaches here. They can click on different stuff. Um, you know, you can make it a bit bigger. I was just sort of playing with this before when I was doing this video, uh, or you can get rid of that. And you can maybe put in, you know, a thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can make these templates quite interactive with lots of people in it at the same time. And I think that's really quite interesting because you can see there's that workshop feature down the bottom and that would allow you to have it in a interactive workshop with lots of users in it. So I haven't set that up for this one right now. Um, and so I think that's pretty, that's pretty neat. Uh, the next, the next piece here is there's just one more and it's about that um, design handover to, um, to, to Zeppelin. And so there is one more tool that we would use in terms of a Zeppelin tool. And that's maybe not something that you're going to do as part of the remote research more or something that you would do as an outcome of doing the designs from the remote research. And Zeppelin is a tool that takes static um, designs and turns them into CSS code and really can help a lot with reducing the ambiguity for um, developers who really want to be very clear on colors and sizing and pixels and all of that stuff. It's a really, it's a really neat tool. So definitely recommend using it. Miro, like you saw with Adobe XD, Miro is definitely um, very collaborative, definitely allows you to have heaps of stakeholders in there, allows you to bring it, do um, really big workshops. Uh, and it allows you to have, so we've got a few different uh, persona boards in here, but it allows you to potentially based off each of these boards, you could have all sorts of different personas in there. So you could have, we could have all sorts of information coming through. So one of those artboards could be an Excel spreadsheet. Another one of those artboards could be some Adobe XD wireframes. Another one could be some of the video interviews that you've got. Another one could be dovetail. So all of a sudden you can have all of your raw artifacts in one spot. Uh, as well as some templates that you're going to do from an activity perspective, you know, maybe you've got a, a jobs to be done canvas in here too, as part of your workshop. So it's a very powerful tool mirror. And I think that, you know, it's definitely one of those ones that will enable a very, a very collaborative workshop. It just requires you to have done that homework beforehand. Uh, you really need to be very clear on what you're doing, very clear on the activities, make sure that all of the users are across how it works how they do it, how they can engage with it. And I think that's, that's the key, you know? So I think coming back, coming sort of to the end of my talk now, in terms of what we think is important, it's about collaborating. I think it's really important to be collaborative with everyone, be consistent. Um, you must be consistent with what you do. I think that consistency really helps, you know, from providing all of the information that users need, stakeholders need, you really set things up for success. You're consistent with how you use them. They're clear. There's clarity around it. It's, it, it really helps a lot. And we found that our research has really improved because of putting in this bit more rigor and a bit more preparation really helps. Um, you prioritize what you do, be very clear on the prioritization and curate as well. Make sure that you curate what you do. So, you know, as part of your, your prep for using online tools like Miro or Adobe XD, make sure you curate the process because if you don't, um, it can be uh, not as engaging and you can start to lose the, uh, lose the enthusiasm of your stakeholders or people who are participating. And you don't want to do that because it's taken you a lot of time and a lot of effort to get that together. So I think it's really important to, uh, to really focus in on that. Um, and then lastly, we are going to be doing an Enterprise UX conference on the 19th of June. So this is a bit of a blatant plug. So you can hit me up for more details. We're just finalizing our speakers and we're going to announce it on Monday. Um, but that'll be on the 19th of June. And the theme of that will be more around remote 
research, how it works, um, and um, how you can uh, hopefully learn from others in case studies. Um, but anyway, that's me. Thank you. Uh, don't forget to wash your hands, hand sanitizer, and uh, great. That was good. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for that, Adam. Um, just before uh, we go, is, are there any questions from um, anyone here? Feel free to either unmute yourself and ask Adam directly or um, pop it into the little chat box here as well. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves and um, ask Adam. I think I saw someone. Anne-Marie, was that you trying to unmute? There you go. One sec. It wasn't. I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And also to, to let Adam know, um, every, everybody know, when you've got people on video like me, I'm frantically taking notes and I realised I was halfway through that it might look like I was distracted and not paying any attention doing other things. But I, I took a lot of value from it. Um, I did miss the last section, so I don't want to ask a question might have already been covered. Uh, but I did want to jump in and say thank you. Oh, no, my pleasure. If there's any other questions you've got, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer them. All right. Well, I don't think there's any more questions. So I'm just going to give you a few more seconds. If you're trying to unmute or if you're trying to put a question to the chat, um, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll let Adam go. And this session is recorded. So it will be an available resource on our website, so tankstreamlabs.com. But thank you so much for your time, Adam. That was a lot of info <laughs> to take in, but I'm sure everyone um, got some benefit out of that as well. And we shall see you um, at the next um, Open Tankstream Labs Lunch and Learn series. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Nice to talk. See you later. Stay safe. Bye.